Hi everyone, this video series is about sleep and sensation for AP Psychology students. We're currently in unit one called Biological Basis of Behavior. This particular video will focus on the sensation of sight and vision. As you can see in our unit overview, we are towards the end of unit one, focusing on that topic section called sensation. These are the key focus questions that will be covered in today's video. They will outline the major themes of the lesson on vision. By the end, you should be able to answer each one of them. These are the essential concepts related to sight and vision. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So first, before I start the content, I want to explain the order of the slides. So first you'll see that I've included the text boxes from the College Board's CED for AP Psychology students. These are essential concepts and topics that they want students to know. You'll notice that I will highlight the sections I'll be covering on each of the slides. And you'll notice that in this particular section, I'm not necessarily going in the same order as the CED. This is because I think it's helpful to start with the stimulus in the environment, which in our case is light, and then follow light through the eye, explaining each of the different parts of the eye before going into things like color vision, color blindness, and visual deficiencies. So let's Let's start with light. Light is a type of energy that travels in waves. Our eyes are fantastic organs that detect light. We actually can only detect a small range of light. These waves are called visible light. Wavelengths refer to the distances between the peaks of light waves. And you can see pictured on this slide that the distances between peaks can be short or long. And this is what influences its color. Visible light waves they range from 400 to 700 nanometers, and short wavelengths are interpreted as blue, long wavelengths are interpreted as red, and medium wavelengths are perceived as green. So let's work through the passage of light through the eye. I'm using a 3D model that's cut through the center that allows you to see the structures inside of the eye. And I will follow the pathway of structures that are listed at the bottom of the screen. You might notice I've included a few additional terms and in a slightly different order than what's listed in the CED. And as I noted in the previous slide, I'm going to start with light in the environment and then work through how it passes through the eye, defining each of the structures along the way. So let's start with light as it enters the eye. The light enters through the cornea first. The cornea is not labeled on this particular diagram, but you can still see it. The cornea is a transparent dome-shaped structure that covers the outer surface of the eye. The cornea is the first part of the eye to encounter the light, and it bends it into the eye, and it begins to focus the light. From the cornea, the light passes through a small layer of clear fluid, and it reaches the pupil. The pupil is a small hole in the eye, so it's not necessarily a structure per se, but rather an opening in the center of the iris. The size of the pupil is controlled by the iris, which regulates the amount of light entering the eye. And the iris is labeled with the number three on this 3D model. The iris is the colorful part of the eye that surrounds the pupil, and it's a muscle that constricts and relax to adjust the amount of light coming into the eye. From the pupil, the light passes through the lens, which is labeled with the number four on our 3D model. Here. The lens is transparent and it's a flexible structure located just behind the iris and the pupil. The lens continues to focus the light by changing its shape, becoming thicker and thinner to help focus on objects at different distances. After the light passes through the lens, it travels through a clear gel in the center of the eye and then reaches the retina. And the retina is labeled with the number two on our 3D model. The retina is a layer of light sensitive tissue around the back of the eye, and the retina contains photoreceptors. These are cells that detect light and convert it into electrical signals. These signals are sent to the brain through the optic nerve, which is labeled number one on our 3D model. You might notice that the CED calls it the visual nerve. The optic nerve carries the electrical signals to the brain's occipital lobes to be processed and interpreted. The fovea is not labeled with a number on this 3D model, but the fovea is a spot located on the retina. And if you were to draw an imaginary line from the object that the eye was fixed on, the point would touch the back of the retina, and this would be the fovea. This is the central point of vision where the light is focused onto the retina. The fovea is responsible for our sharp, 
central focused vision. Notice on the 3D model where the optic nerve attaches to the retina, in this spot, we have no visual abilities because there's no photoreceptors where the nerve touches the retina. So believe it or not, we have no visual ability in this spot. So it's called the blind spot. The brain takes all of the visual information it receives from the electrical signals, and then it reproduces it into a real-time visual image of what is being seen in the environment. So now that you've learned about the structures of the eye, you know that the lens plays an essential part in our eye's ability to focus on objects near and far through a process called accommodation. This process by which the lens changes its shape to focus on objects at different distances is referred to as accommodation. So you might wonder why some people have difficulty seeing objects far away or close up. We often refer to these conditions as being nearsighted or farsighted or myopia or hyperopia, nearsighted individuals can see objects close to them well, but objects farther away become blurry. Whereas farsighted individuals can see objects in the distance well, but when the objects get closer to them, it becomes more difficult to see. These conditions are not necessarily caused by the lens in the eye, but can be corrected by lenses outside of the eye. In the case of nearsightedness, the shape of the eye causes the light to focus too early before hitting the retina. In cases of farsightedness, the shape of the eye is causing the light to focus behind the retina. Refraction of the eye causes light rays to bend as they pass through the cornea and lens, focusing them onto the retina in the back of the eye. Due to this bending, the image formed on the retina is flipped upside down and reversed left to right. You can see this represented in the diagram of the eye on the screen. Notice how the candle is flipped upside down as it passes through the eye onto the retina. The way light is traveling through the eye results in this inverted image. Then the brain processes and flips the image back to its correct orientation. So as you learned in our previous video, our body has sensory receptors all throughout picking up information from the environment in places like our skin, our nose, our ears, our tongue, and even our eyes. These sensory receptors detect a stimuli like light and then transform it into an electrical message that can pass through the nervous system onto the brain. And this process of changing a stimulus that's detected in the environment into an action potential or an electrical impulse is called transduction. The sensory cells in the eyes that transduce light are called photoreceptors. Photoreceptors are found in the retina, which as you know, is a very light sensitive tissue in the back of the eye. And the retina is where light is converted into electrical signals through cells called rods and cones. Light travels all the way to the back of the retina and then is converted into electrical signals. That electrical impulse travels from the rods and cones to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells, and then to the optic nerve, which travels to the brain. So let's talk about rods and cones. Rods are not found in the fovea, but rather scattered throughout the retina. Therefore, they are essential for our peripheral vision. Rods also detect low light levels, so they are essential for our night vision. Sometimes they're described as being very light sensitive, which means that they can detect light in very low light conditions. Rods do not perceive color, but rather in shades of gray. Cones are concentrated in the fovea. Remember, this is the very center of the retina where light is directly focused onto. Cones detect color and fine detail. So here are a few important takeaways from this section. Rods and cones convert light into electrical signals. This is called transduction. Rods detect light in grayscale and can operate in low levels of light. They help us with our peripheral vision. Cones are located in the center of the eye. This is what's responsible for detecting color and clarity. And lastly, electrical signals are sent from the rods and cones to the bipolar cells, which send the message to the ganglion cells. And then it's processed through signals that are sent through the optic nerve to the brain for interpretation. So there are two theories of color vision that you need to be familiar with. They are the trichromatic theory of color and the opponent process theory. And these theories build upon one another to help us better understand our color vision. So the trichromatic theory is based on the idea that we have three cone photoreceptors that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. The first is sensitive to short wavelengths, and this would help us detect blue. 
Then there is the cone that is sensitive to medium wavelengths, and this would help our eyes detect colors of green. And then there is the third cone, which is sensitive to long wavelengths, which would help us detect reds. Now, the idea is that these wavelengths are picked up by different cones, and a combination of cones that are active would allow us to see multiple colors and blends of different colors. So for example, if the blue and green cones are strongly activated, this would help us perceive the color cyan. In summary, the trichromatic theory of color is the idea that we have three different cones in our retinas, and these help us detect three different wavelengths. And any of those cones that activate together combine to give us a full range of colors. The next theory is the opponent process theory. These two theories are not necessarily in opposition to each other, but they work together to help explain how we detect and perceive color. The trichromatic theory came first, and then the opponent process theory followed up. You can say they're complementary because the trichromatic theory of color is based on the activity of three cones in the retina, and it accounts for our initial detection of color, whereas the opponent process theory explains how that information is processed and perceived after it's been detected and how those colors are perceived in relation to one another. So to define the opponent process theory, the cones detect the color and then their signals are processed in pairs of opposing color channels. So those would be red versus green, blue versus yellow, and black versus white. This occurs in the ganglion cells of the retina in the brain's visual pathways. The signals from the cones are then combined in a way that creates opposing color responses. So the opponent process theory explains how our brain process co processes color after the cones in our eyes detect it. For the red versus green channel, the brain compares signals from the red sensitive cones and the green sensitive cones. And when one is active, it makes the other seem less noticeable. So if a red cone is more active, it will be perceived as red, not green. For blue-yellow, the brain compares blue-sensitive cones with a mix of green and red-sensitive cones, creating a contrast between blue and yellow. When one is more active, it makes the opposing color seem less noticeable, perceiving it either as blue or yellow. This is the opponent process theory. The afterimage effect is evidence that helps us prove the opponent process theory. It shows us that the brain processes colors in opposing pairs. Because the afterimage effect shows us that when you tire out one color, like red, its opposing channel, green, becomes more noticeable when you look away. The afterimage effect can be defined as the visual phenomenon where an image continues to appear in your vision after you've looked away from it, but in its inverted colors. You can test this with the flag on the screen. I'll give you the instructions and then you'll need to pause to complete the demonstration. So please stare at the flag that's colored in yellow, blue, and black. Set a timer for 30 seconds and stare into the flag until the timer goes off. Then you can either shut your eyes or shift your gaze onto a blank wall or space in your area. This afterimage phenomenon can be explained by the opponent process theory because your blue yellow channel will tire of sending yellow. And after you shift your gaze, the yellow will be replaced with its opposing color blue. And the blue and black stripes will be replaced with red and white stripes. So go ahead and pause the video and try this out if you'd like. So now that we've learned about different color vision theories, let's talk about colorblindness. Colorblindness is a condition where people have difficulty distinguishing between certain colors due to issues with their color vision system, and it affects how colors are perceived. Colorblindness impacts about 8% of men and about 0.5% of women globally. It's often inherited and more common in males due to its genetic link to the X chromosome. Dichromatism is a type of colorblindness where a person has two types of functioning color receptors or cones, and instead of having those usual three, the person interprets colors just using those two functioning cones. So if the individual is lacking either the red or green cone, this makes it difficult for them to distinguish reds from greens. A lack of a blue cone leads to the difficulty distinguishing blues and yellows. Dichromatism also helps us better understand our theories of color. Missing one type of cone, either red, green, or blue, limits the ability to see certain colors, and in the absence of one cone, this disrupts that normal balance between opposing color pairs. 
Monochromatism is a form of colorblindness where only one type of photoreceptor or none at all are functioning correctly, resulting in seeing the world in shades of grays. Depicted on the screen are types of dichromatism, and you can see how by eliminating one of those cones, the individual loses the ability to perceive differences between colors. So in a previous video, when you were learning about research on the brain, you learned about the visual pathways from the eyes to the occipital lobe, and you learned about this through the split brain patients. So hopefully this will be a quick refresher slide on the visual pathways. As you know, visual information enters the eye through both visual fields, and each eye sends this information through the optic nerves to the optic chiasm. And this is where it partially crosses so that visual information from the right visual field of both eyes is processed in the left visual hemisphere of the brain and the visual information from the left visual field picked up by both eyes then goes to the right hemisphere to be processed. I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the previous video, so it's worth noting here that from the optic chiasm, this visual information is sent to the thalamus because remember, the thalamus is the part of the brain that takes in sensory information and sends it to the part of the cerebral cortex that processes it. So from the thalamus, the electric signals are sent to the occipital lobes in the back of the brain where they're processed and then they are interpreted as a visual image. So let's finish today's video with two types of visual processing disorders. These are disorders that are linked to dysfunction in the brain. Prosopagnosia is also known as face blindness, and this is a neurological condition where individuals have difficulty recognizing and processing faces despite having functioning eyes, normal vision, and normal cognitive abilities. People with this condition often struggle to recognize familiar faces. They see the face, but they don't necessarily register all the parts together, which can affect their social interactions and daily life. They may rely on non-facial cues, things like voice, clothing, or hairstyle to help them identify individuals. This condition is linked to damage or dysfunction in the fusiform gyrus, which is the part of the brain that's located in the temporal lobe, stretching back to the occipital lobe. This region is specifically involved in facial recognition, and you can see it on the diagram on the screen. You can see we're looking at an image of the brain from the underneath side where the brain stem and cerebellum are most evident, the red portion that the fusiform gyrus. Prosopagnosia can be present from birth or acquired through brain injury or stroke. The prevalence of prosopagnosia varies with cases from birth affecting about 2% of the population. Our last condition is called blindsight, which happens when a person has damage to the part of their brain that's responsible for processing conscious visual information. This means that their eyes are still functioning normally and can pick up visual information. However, due to damage to the primary visual cortex of the occipital lobe, this information is not being processed in a way that they are actually able to see in the usual sense. So instead, the visual information takes an alternative route through other parts of the brain that handle movement and reflexes and spatial awareness. And these parts of the brain can still use the visual information to help the person respond to their environment. So even though they're not consciously aware of what they're seeing because their occipital lobe is unable to process it, their eyes are still taking in that visual information and they're able to see in a non-traditional way because their brain takes that visual information to other areas of their occipital lobe that help them navigate and react to things around them. So even though they can't see the objects, they sometimes still react to them. So if you were to throw a ball at someone with blind sight, they might be able to catch it or avoid it even though they can't see it. They might be able to navigate around obstacles without actually being aware of them. This is referred to as blind sight. So now that we're finished with the content from today's video, let's do a few questions for review. Remember, you'll need to pause the video to determine the answer and I'll show the correct answers on the last slide. Question number one says, which eye structure is the arrow pointing to? Question number two says, what is the function associated with the structure the arrow is pointing to? Question number three says, which of the following structures helps you most in detecting the color of your friend's shirt? Question number four says, which condition best describes the vision deficiency related to lacking one cone? So this concludes part three vision for AP Psychology students. 